am so incredibly happy to have Dr. Sarah Gordon joining us today. So Sarah is co-founder and CEO of Satala Sustainability and Risk Management, and she's also co-founder of the not-for-profit Responsible Raw Materials and production company Critical Productions. She's got a bit on. Uh, having started her career as an exploration geologist before moving into risk uh, management and sustainability, Sarah has always been passionate about ensuring that we make sustainability a reality. And with her expertise, I am super excited to hear from her about ESG, FAD or fundamentals. So it's going to be a great session. Please use the chat and we'll open up the floor at the end. And yes, thank you so much for joining. It's incredible having you, Sarah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jess, for, for having me here today. And Magic Mike, not a stripper, truly amazing. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, absolutely brilliant. And just, just to show everybody as well, the playing cards that I managed to find, they've got minerals on them. Oh. How cool is that? Yeah, so, we could have, we we're so close. Next time, we'll do it next time. <laughs> next time, next time, there we go. So yeah, as you can tell from the fact that I have these playing cards at home, Deep down in my heart, I am very much still a geo. So that's where I came from. I started out life as an exploration geo. Um, then I worked on site um, in well, all over the world. I was really lucky. Um, and then I went into sustainability and then into risk and assurance, which sounds deadly dull, but I kind of threaten people when I'm delivering risk management training courses that I, I can make their life even more fun by uh, talking about rocks. And sometimes they take me up on it because, as we know, rocks is where it's at. That. Um, but what I'm going to talk to everyone about today is ESG, so that's Environment, Social and government, Governance. Um, is this a fad or is it fundamental to what we do every day or basically to the planet as a whole? So to start off with this, let's just align ourselves as to what do we actually mean by this thing called ESG? I suspect all of you are already experts in all of this, but let's just go back in time. Not so many years, to be honest, but back to the 1980s. So back in 1987, there was a really important paper published, which was called Our Common Future. And within it, we have various different, different definitions or at least different looks at what is meant by sustainable development. And what we find here is that definition for sustainable development basically being development that meets the needs of now without compromising the needs of future generations. Now, to be honest, that definition still holds true to this day, but there's a little bit of a tweak because it's not just about stopping bad stuff for future generations. Instead, we also add in, well, where could we enhance the lives of future generations as well? So this is what people were talking about back in the 1980s. And when people were having their sustainability conferences and they were talking about what is now called ESG in part, there were three main pillars that people would refer to. So people would refer to the social aspects of sustainability. Um, and as you can see here, that included everything from empowerment, cultural preservation, social mobility. So that's what was meant back in the 1980s by the social realm with regards to sustainability. On the environmental side, it was very much about natural resources, biodiversity, clean air and water. So it's all the same stuff that we speak about today. Now, climate change isn't in there because back in 1987, um, certainly when I was at school, um, the world was cooling. So this is, again, I guess, testament to the fact that our scientific understanding evolves with time. And so those focus points, of course, do change depending on what our understanding says and what it's all about. The third area of sustainability back in the 1980s was this economic pillar. And it's this economic pillar which actually throws up some of the problems in the world of sustainability and ESG, because economic isn't really about making lots of money. Instead, it's about growth and it's about that distribution and use of resources. So it's more about the sharing of wealth rather than making lots of money. OK, so that's what people were talking about here when they talked about social environment and economic aspects with regards to sustainable development back in the 1980s. Now, if we come forwards into the 1990s, 
And this is where we get this guy called John Elkington, who's actually, I think, giving one of the keynote talks at the SEG conference happening in London um, in a few months time. And John Elkington said, hang on, I've developed something brand new. <clears throat> And it's called the three P's or the triple bottom line. And I'm going to refer to sustainability as being about people, planet and profit. Now, fantastically intelligent individual, absolutely brilliant at what he does. But of course, people, planet and profit is very similar to the social environment and economic aspects of sustainable development, as was being spoken about in the 1980s. And we can come forwards from this as well. People decided that, again, this word profit was a problem. And actually, people started calling it prosperity. And you see that coming through in a big way. And then we have huge development of this world um, within sustainable development. And of course, in 2015, we had the launch of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, sometimes called the UN SDGs or the Unsustainable Development Goals. No, it's not really called that. Um, so we've got the Sustainable Development Goals. And what you can see here are 17 different goals that span everything from dealing with poverty, health, gender equality, um, innovation and infrastructure. Of course, climate change is in there as just one of the 17 different aspects. And then finishing up with things like peace and justice and then partnerships for the goals. So saying we actually need to collaborate as a planet. So that was how we sort of viewed sustainability, et cetera, back in 2015. And these still hold true to this day. The thing about the SDGs is that they're usually put in place or these kind of goals are put in place for 15 years. So we've got until 2030 to eradicate poverty, to make sure we've switched across to renewable energy, et cetera. These are big ambitions, big targets. But you know what? Even though the world looks very different now in 2023 compared to 2015, a lot of these goals still hold true and at least allow us to view the breadth of sustainability. So what do we really mean by all of it? So that then builds us up to, well, what do we actually mean by this thing called ESG? Because ESG is just the latest incarnation of all of that stuff. Now, of course, different people interpret ESG in slightly different ways, but I'm going to drive straight down the middle of those definitions. Now, of course, ESG stands for environment, social and governance. So important to note, this is not environment governance and social governance this is environment and social and governance all coming together a bit like a venn diagram exactly how people used to draw it back in the 1980s and what kind of things do we look for in these different spaces well on the environmental aspect, we're talking about everything, again, from biodiversity, land use, how we're managing our waste. Of course, climate change tends to crop up in here. Things like water, for example, hugely important in that environmental sphere. But then when we hop across to the social aspects, you can see here that some of these areas are exactly the same because water is just as important for people as it is for the environment. And this is important because sometimes when people are trying to get their heads around, well, hang on a second, am I an expert in which area? You get a little bit of conflict because, yeah, who's, who's water? Wh where is water most important for? So these are things where we do have overlap between these three different areas of ESG. On the social side, of course, we're also talking about things like expectations for shared value, different types of social impact, that social context, et cetera. So lots of different aspects coming together there. And of course, our health and safety tends to kind of fall into that social space. And then finally, the G, which is probably the most difficult bit to get our heads around because Governance, this is where the lawyers often sit, by the way. So you, we, we can all imagine the social scientists, we can all imagine the environmental scientists, but it's often the lawyers who sit in the governance area. And governance really consists of two parts. So you have what's going on at that national or that, that large scale area. So what does the what do what kind of regulatory bodies exist within that jurisdiction? How good is the governance? And we know that from country to country, some countries have very different forms of governance that are in place. So you've got what's going on at the macro level, and then you've got what's going on 
within a company itself. So how does that company actually govern itself? So what kind of corporate governance does it have? And that includes everything from business ethics, tax transparency, what does compliance actually mean to us, through to things like who's on your board of directors or who's in your leadership team, um, how do you undertake your stakeholder engagement, all of those different areas generally fit into the governance bit. So that's what we mean by ESG. And we can pull all of this together into a nice little diagram where we say, OK, the E is therefore it's all about nature. It's about making sure we have balance. It's about making sure we are properly being stewards of the land and we're protecting, but also optimizing our planet. The S, of course, is all about people and making sure that everybody involved in that particular project, or again, that patch of land, they're not only treated with dignity and respect, but they have freedom to make their own choices, but also freedom to innovate and to do things in a different way and actually to evolve with time as well. And then finally, we have the G. Um, and the G, as I mentioned, is probably the most difficult to pin down. Really, G is about culture. So who are we? As a team, how do we actually run our organizations? Yes, we've got the compliance aspects, also the accountability aspects, but ultimately what we're trying to build here is trust. And those three areas together, if we've got them all working, that is what gives us sustainability. So ESG, hugely complicated with regards to that wide variety of aspects. There are some things in here that are relatively easy to measure. There are some things in here which are nigh on impossible to measure. And that is what perhaps gives rise to the whole fad versus fundamental dilemma that we have. So if we take a bit of a step back and we say, why is there a lot of, um, are there a lot of newspaper articles, et cetera, around the world that say that ESG is just some big fad? OK, and, and it doesn't you can Google very quickly. And I'm pretty sure Magic Mike, not a stripper, could uh, could do probably a fairly boring magic trick for us right now where we had to Google ESG and woke in the same sentence. And I don't know what kind of words might come up with that. But there's a huge amount of rhetoric out there that says, hang on a second, all of this ESG stuff is just a sham. It's all about certain groups of people either trying to make money or greenwashing or pretending that they're doing something good when actually what they're doing is really bad. So there's a huge amount of press out there, especially in certain parts of the world. Now, what's really going on here is a, a lot of the drivers of ESG being a fad is coming from the where ESG meets finance. And so, of course, when we're trying to move ESG into that economic side of things, there are a number of different models that, again, have been developed over many years now. So things like the donut economy through to the triple bottom line, as I mentioned earlier on. So that's just your people, planet, prosperity. These are effectively new ways of valuing what we have round about us. And what they're trying to do is to push us beyond just financial wealth and say, well, hang on a second. How can we value the environmental wealth as well as societal wealth as well? And as soon as we start doing this, some people get really scared because it makes them less wealthy. Because we're beginning to say, hang on a second, what you've got maybe isn't as good as what it could be compared to everybody else. So it makes people feel incredibly threatened. Also within this, there are a lot of organizations who have been set up who are charlatans, who are making lots of money off saying the right sustainability things, but aren't necessarily driving through with the action to make sure that the world is more of a sustainable place. So to be honest, a lot of these news stories are fairly justified. A lot of them are grounded in fact, but the fact that it's attacking ESG and saying all of this is wrong is a bit of a problem because actually when it comes down to it, the fundamental aspects of ESG are pretty crucial to all of us on this planet. Now, 
I'm um, speaking to you from the Northern Hemisphere. You can probably tell from my accent that I am indeed British. Um, I'm originally from Scotland, so it, I'm not going to mention crickets or, or anything like that, given that there are a number of Aussies on the call. Congratulations. Um, but this is something where, I mean, you'd be forgiven for thinking that all of Europe is currently on fire at the moment. Um, and we're not used to having things like wildfires in Europe. This is really quite unusual for us. And so this is something where when we say, well, hang on, let's look at this full variety of sustainable development goals. Do we have a handle on all of them? Some of them, yep, yeah, we're making progress, but there are others where we've got serious problems. And of course, one of those goals, number 13, is climate change. Now, I'm pretty sure that you've all seen diagrams like this before. And yes, there are many people who still don't feel that the science is necessarily there to prove that the climate is changing. Now, we're all, or many of us are geoscientists, we know the Earth climate constantly changes naturally. But of course, what we're worried about is, well, what's the impact of human beings on that environment? And actually, more than that, is there anything that we can actually do? So the whole climate change discussion is actually about what can we control and what can't we control? And if there are things that we can control, then let's just get on and do it. Even if the science is wrong, it's better to hedge our bets and do something about it. So with regards to ESG, ESG includes all of these aspects of climate change. Climate change perhaps has been taking over the, the ESG or the sustainability discussion almost to the detriment of some of the other areas in recent years, but we need to see them all as a package, as a whole. And the fact of the matter is that if we don't get a handle on some of these, with a population that is, what, we're, we're kind of an 8 billion type direction now, we're going to have serious problems. So how on earth do we deal with a planet that has more and more and more people on it? We know that our planet is fragile, as is our own existence on it, we need to work out how to make this as sustainable as possible. So with regards to the title of the talk, so ESG, fad or fundamental, when I was putting together this talk, I thought, well, hang on a second. The people who are saying that it's all a fad compared to the people who are saying that it's fundamental, are we actually talking about the same thing? Or are we talking about something that's slightly different? So when you look at people slamming ESG in the press, they're mostly talking about the measurement of ESG and the use of ESG in finance, which is quite different to where we're actually trying to make ESG a reality and we're trying to operate in the most responsible ways possible. So I think that actually, yes, there are some aspects of ESG which are a fad, but we still need to do it. It's still fundamental. So what does all of this actually look like for the mining sector, which is, of course, where I spend an awful lot of my time? So is ESG a fad or is it fundamental within mining? So let's start off with the fad aspects. Now, I suspect that many of you have gone or are planning to go to one of the many mining conferences or exploration conferences that will be taking part, you know, place over the next 12 months or so. <clears throat> and something that, of course, has changed immeasurably since, um, since I first started going to these conferences is, of course, the presence of sustainability or ESG in that discussion space. It wasn't so many years ago that I actually... I had to pay money to get them to put sustainability on the agenda of these conferences, whereas now ESG dominates rather a lot of it. And we hear the same talks being reeled out again and again. Some of them are really useful. Some of them are just saying the same old stuff. So this is something here where, yes, ESG should be on the agenda and we should be having these conversations. But are we actually saying what really needs to be said or just reeling out the same old stuff? So. We see a lot of it within our conferences. Also, on the measurement side, there are a never-ending array of different league tables where, as projects or as companies, we get compared to one another with regards to ESG scores. And some of these organizations, for example, they will just scrape the internet 
and they will say, okay, what kind of score do we want to give you? And then if you want to challenge it or to find out why they thought you were better or worse than some of your next door neighbors, they will charge you $10,000 or something like that for the privilege of speaking to you on the phone. Can you tell that I have a slight problem <laughs> with regards to that business model? I don't think this is necessarily helping people because it's not necessarily showing the true reflection of what is going on on the ground for that mining company or that exploration company. Also, we have some methods of scoring, such as the, the carbon disclosure program, where just because of the nature of our industry, it's very, very, very difficult to score well because we're being compared against everybody else. And what happens in a lot of this is if we think about the value chain for exploration and development project, mining, then through into those post mining activities, maybe closure, et cetera, we know that an exploration company is very, very different to a mining company, yet a lot of these measurement tools assume because we're all in the same sector together, the exploration is viewed or is done in the same way as a full-blown mining operation. And what this means is that say you are an exploration or a development company, it is highly, highly, highly unlikely that you are ever going to be able to score in the top half of tables such as CDP. And that is because they assume that we're all the same and they don't take into account that you're a project rather than a more stable operation. And it's because the people who put these together don't necessarily understand the sector um, or because they don't want to go to that level of granularity that might be needed in order to be able to give that true reflection. Now, that would be OK if our investors didn't ask us for, OK, what is your CDP? <laughs> and we're expecting you to improve from one year to the next. You have to then very politely work out how to improve the awareness of those investors because they obviously don't understand how these measurement tools actually work. So there's a whole world of pain that comes together within the measurement of ESG. And of course, this goes on. There's huge amounts of accusations of greenwashing because, of course, when people think about mining, they think about great big dirty holes in the ground. And so then, of course, they say, well, how on earth, how could this be good for the environment or for people? You know, there's there's no way. And of course, you can watch whatever film you want. This one, of course, is uh, is from Avatar. Find me a film where mining is the good guy or is the hero. Typically, the mining sector is generally the villain in any form of film that you go to see. So what we have here are measurement tools that aren't necessarily helping us at the moment as a sector. And the vast majority of them certainly don't reward those really good operations or exploration projects for where they're looking for the opportunities within ESG rather than just those threats that they might need to manage. So that's the fad side. How about the fundamental side? So why, why is ESG absolutely fundamental for the mining sector, inclusive of exploration? Well, to start with, if we decide it's all a fad and we don't need to do it, we're not going to get the people we need to come and join our sector. We know that the amount of material that we need to be able to find and extract from the ground and process all in a responsible manner over the next few decades is vast. We know that the energy tra transition is driving massive demand for what it is that we do. Now, we could take the stance and say, well, you need us, or if you want one of these things, then of course you need mining. By the way, saying that to somebody on the street or somebody who's anti-mining is probably the most condescending thing you can do. <laughs> so as a sector, we should probably stop doing that. So this is something here where, unless we show actually as a sector, we can embrace 
all of the upsides that come with ESG, and I'll show some of them in a second, but actually we are trying to operate in the most responsible way possible. Um, and if we go back to that little definition or the little Venn diagram of ESG, and we look at all of these areas, the best mining operations and the best exploration projects are doing all of this. The problem is we do have bad actors in this sector. And also many of those bad actors are quite good at making money. So guess who gets the investment? We still haven't quite gone over that tipping point yet to say, hang on a second, where does the value sit and where does the money go? So if you wanna be doing ESG really well, this is what you're aiming at. And of course, we're still as a sector trying to get over that hurdle. And I'm not saying that people don't do it yet because of course they do. By doing it right, that's how we attract the best possible people into the sector and also induce the type of innovation that we really need. We know that we've dug the easiest rocks out of the ground. We know that the energy transition requires a very different mix of commodities compared to what we've dug out of the ground before. So therefore we need to work out how on, how on earth are we gonna process those brand new lithium deposits, for example, how are we gonna do it? No one's done it before. Um, so this is a really, 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 really exciting time, but we need to make ourselves attractive so that people actually come and join us. Again, I'm not saying that we don't have good people in the sector, we do, we've got phenomenal people, but we need lots more. So. By getting ESG right and making sure we're not just doing it to tick a box, that really helps us to get the right people into the sector. But beyond that, there is so much opportunity when we start putting on that ESG hat. So, for example, in terms of carbon sequestration, I think it was probably, if not lecture number one, lecture number two, when I did my undergraduate at the University of Glasgow, was the carbon cycle. We know about the carbon cycle as geologists. And of course, we know that if you want to extract carbon dioxide, et cetera, from the atmosphere and lock it up somewhere where it really isn't going to be released, then turning it into a mineral or sticking it underground is the right way to go. Does this cost money? Yes, it does. Does it need more research? Yes, it does. But it's a much more permanent solution than planting loads of trees for example. Now, this is beginning to come through in certain parts of the world. People are beginning to start to use this. But of course, depending on the geology of the assets that we've got, there is huge potential here to say, well, actually, over the life of that asset, and even after we finished extracting the ore or whatever it is we're digging out the ground, what is the future potential for carbon sequestration with regards to that? And I'm seeing more and more projects begin to think about that at the moment. It's still not commonplace, but this is massive. And I've just put in two papers um, uh, and this one here, for example, only came out pretty recently that talks about we don't just need the basaltic rocks, et cetera. Actually, if you crush or you grind rocks in a carbon rich atmosphere, that can enhance the sequestration that you get. So there's some really awesome research that's coming through now. But what does it mean across the mining value chain as a whole and going beyond just that climate change, just that carbon side? So if we think about our mining value chain going from exploration into the project stage operations and then post mining, Obviously, in exploration, this is the really cool bit where we've got loads of different options for, OK, well, what am I looking for? Um, what kind of setting is it in? Should there actually be a mine here? If there is, how would we manage our waste? What about the infrastructure that we need, the power, the water? Most importantly, who's already there? So who else has ownership over that land? What about other geo resources, for example, that are sitting in that area? So exploration is an awesome phase. And then, of course, you go into your project side um, phase where, again, we keep narrowing down how are we actually going to go through the operation, how are we going to dig the material out of the ground, into the operating phase, and then out into what I've called here as post mining. So note, I haven't used the word closure. And instead, what a lot of thinking is now considering um, is saying, well, hang on. If your primary commodity initially was copper, what else could come out of the ground? Um, can the tailings be reworked or the fact that you've gone and 
dug these access points effectively, what else could come out the ground either at the same time or slightly later? Do other companies want to go into that asset? What's going on with regards to it? And how is it supporting the local economy, the local people who live there? Um, I've worked on a number of different operations in different parts of Africa where there was nobody living there before the mine got started. And then, of course, you get you end up with quite large communities of people that have been collected together because of the mining. That's been the focal point. So what happens after that non-renewable resource is dug out the ground? What do we what do we do now? Sometimes, of course, there are fantastic plans that are put in place. Sometimes they work. Many times, though, or much of the time, actually, people want to stay and they say, well, hang on. What kind of economy is here for us? Because the, the mine is finished. What is left for us? What can we what can we build with regards to that? So with regards to that value chain for mining, and of course, we've got various, very long time horizons compared to how almost any other sector works, we need to be thinking about all of these different aspects. And one of the big shifts that we're seeing happen at the moment is, of course, that move from focusing in on the operation phase, because that's, of course, where the money is made, to actually say, you know what, mining itself is just one large construction project that unlocks a more developed future for that particular patch of land. And that is a massive mindset shift. Many people have already been thinking like this, of course they have, but to get people to think nigh on a hundred years in the future is, is difficult. Although of course, from a geology perspective, we're used to millions of years, so we can deal with all of that. So we've got these time horizons. And if we take John Elkington's triple bottom line and say, okay, from a value perspective, um, from a financial perspective, of course, you make your money when you're digging the rock out the grounds, depending on what's going on. When you hit that closure phase, it might then fall off a cliff. Okay, this is where lots of companies go bust. But if we do this properly, there's no reason why some point in time in the future, the natural developed economy that has sprung up in that area could actually deliver on more value than what originally came out the ground. On a similar vein, from an environmental perspective, this is something where, of course, before you touch it, there is huge value in that area. But that can increase during exploration because we understand more about the biodiversity of that patch of land. There is no doubt that when we're actually mining, we will negatively impact on that environment, even though we have really very small footprints compared to other industries such as agriculture, we will negatively impact on that patch of land, we will seriously change it. And so that, again, is where the closure plans, etc, really come in. But there is no reason, again, why we can't actually build back to something that is better than what was there before if we plan all of this properly and we actually deliver on it. If we then go into the social side, and by the way, every time I draw this graph, people say I need to put more wiggles in on the social line. There will always be people who hate what you're doing and there will always be people who like what you're doing. Um, and of course, this is something where before you even start, you can have variations. And then when we're during that operation phase, um, you will probably be giving people lots of jobs, etc. cetera, um, but there will still be people not liking what you're up to. And this is something again, where if plan and delivered on properly, there is no reason why you can't end up with a net benefit compared to where we were before the mining started. Now, this diagram is especially important for politicians because it's the politicians who are thinking about the development of those patches of land. And they want to be seeing, OK, well, is it worth it? What's that cost benefit analysis look like with regards to allowing a company to go and extract rock from out of out of that patch of earth? What does this actually look like? And from a politician's perspective, even though from an investment and all of those kind of aspects, people might still be focusing in on that operation phase because that's where the relatively short term value addition comes in. Of course, there are some people that would be investing earlier on. From a political perspective, they're actually looking out here for the long term. So what's the big win that could be unlocked by the mining being done properly? So they're looking at that. 
Also, of course, from that politician's angle, they're thinking, yeah, we need to make sure we have security of supply of all of these different materials for the energy transition. And of course, we acknowledge the fact that everything is interconnected. So for example, if I want my country to be able to go all electric vehicle by 2030, 2035, where on earth are we going to be getting, say, just the power to power those vehicles? So are we going to plant, uh, build lots of wind turbines, for example. And if we want lots of wind turbines, where are those rare earth elements going to come from for the magnets within those wind turbines? Governments are only just waking up to the complexity of the supply chain that is needed for the materials that are required for the energy transition, which is why a never ending array of critical mineral strategies are being produced at the moment. So ev almost every government around the world is, has either written or has recently published a critical mineral strategy looking at, well, what does it mean for them? Bringing this back into mining, however, of course, we can view this from a number of aspects. Firstly, we can say, well, how do we actually undertake the mining itself? Secondly, what is it that we're actually producing? So that's where the demand is coming from. Thirdly, when we're actually undertaking be it exploration or we're buying our trucks, are we working with those suppliers? So they, they are actually operating in the most responsible ways possible. So we can um, imply influence with regards to that. And then, of course, we can step out of that and say, well, let's reimagine what mining actually looks like. Are we stewards of the land? What's going on with regards to that post-closure vision? What are we actually unlocking here? So... What this brings together is to say, actually, from a mining perspective, there's a big shift with regards to that focus on responsibility, on sustainability, and of course, on ESG. And it is increasingly becoming absolutely fundamental to us as a sector. If we don't do this, then if nothing else, we're not going to get the people coming and joining our companies, or we're not going to get the best people coming and joining our companies. So to help us do this, of course, there is a delightful world of utter pain, which is where we have all of these different ESG standards, guidelines, principles, et cetera. And I mean, um, I'm involved in writing yet another one at the moment, which makes me hang my head with shame because you think, why do we need yet another one? Um, if you're new to this world, by the way, there's quite a nice um, um, a uh, set of descriptions with regards to some of the main ones that sits at the back of this report. And I can put the link into the chat at the end of the talk. Um, so there's a whole wide array of um, hundreds, quite literally, of these different ESG standards that could be applicable to us within the mining sector, within the exploration sector, or of course, if we're geoscientists that work in other areas, they're gonna be appropriate to us as well. The good news is that there is a world of consolidation going on at the moment and announced only what earlier on this month, the International Sustainability Standards Board, which was set up in November 2021, has said, yeah, we now know how to consolidate all of these other requirements into the same thing. OK, so there's a massive amount of consolidation that is going on in the sustainability space right now at that macro level. What we then need to do within mining, including our investors, for example, is to say, OK, well, what what does this actually mean for us? So those of us, for example, who have been doing TCFD, which is very much focused in on the financial financial aspects of climate change. The good news is that ISSB has just said, yeah, copy paste. It's the same thing, more or less. OK, into ISSB. So they've been really sensible in the consolidation of all of this. So what does all of this mean for, say, exploration? And if I had a cent for every time somebody said to me, my project is too early for ESG, I would be a very, very rich person. Um, it does make me want to cry, but also I think it probably means that people just don't want to speak to me. So I'll take it. I'll take it in both ways. OK, so. Um, my project is too early for ESG is never the case. Of course, if you're right at the beginning of exploration, this is the really, really exciting bit because you get to set the scene for what comes next. You know that when your boots hit the ground or even if you're just looking at the satellite image of that particular area, if you decide to go in, you are going to change it. 
So you can begin to work out, well, what sort of information do I need? How might I want to change this in a responsible manner? Um, and, and this is something where we're not quite seeing the value coming through for ESG yet, but it is coming. It is beginning to arrive and those investors are beginning to come. And there are increasing numbers of case studies where people say, actually, by me being able to prove or to prove that I'm doing ESG properly, we're getting that investment in, which is great. However, the course, as I mentioned earlier on, very few people understand that difference between exploration and mining. And that's one of those key problems. I was in a meeting yesterday where we had exploration companies and we had investors and it was hilarious because the exploration companies were saying, what do you want to know in order for us to be able to prove to you that we're responsible? And the investors went, no, hang on a second, you are the expert, so you tell us what you think we need to know. So you, you've got this, I'm gonna call it a virtuous cycle. I'm gonna say that the glass is half full at the moment. So you've got this whole thing going on between exploration companies and be they investors or regulators or customers where everyone's saying, I don't quite know what it is that we should be measuring or what it is, what good looks like with regards to your particular asset. Now, if there is one rule of thumb, it is what you cannot say is it's too early for us to be doing ESG because it's never too early to do ESG. But you can quite rightly say that actually when you're in that early stage, ESG is maybe going to look slightly different compared to if you are in a more mature stage of that mining life cycle. And that will be because there isn't as much governance, for example, that you need early stage. Also, you're not going to have the capacity be it in terms of resources or time to be able to go out and do the level of environmental impact assessments, et cetera, that you would need if you were in, for, in deeper projects, for example. But you can still do something. And for those people who, for example, go through the, the Digby frameworks, et cetera, if you take these five things that I'm going to run through now, you will score very nicely. And I know this because I was one of the team that helped put together that particular framework. So number one, start collecting and storing baseline data as early as possible. And that could be as simple as just taking pictures of that patch of land and saving them somewhere. It's quite easy to take water samples and you can do really clever things with them now. Look at the waste within those samples that you've got. So yes, you found some, something that's nice and sparkly, but what about the rest of the stuff that's there that from a geology perspective, we kind of go, oh, that's a bit boring. Actually, from an ESG perspective, that's really interesting. So you need to be able to understand all of that. Also, be thinking about the other aspects of value that may well be in the ground. So what else is there that we might have in the ground that we can refer to? Developing that relationship with the local population that is respectful and inclusive is absolutely vital. They have more rights to be there than any of us as geologists. Within the organization, develop that culture of openness so that people can share their ideas and they can also feel supported. And then finally, ensure that your leadership team has the skill sets that's needed, okay? All too often I see board of, boards of directors who are just money people with no evidence of, do they actually understand this asset? Do they understand what is needed for the long-term? So those are five hints if you want to make ESG really, really easy for you. One final thing before I draw to a close, and I promise I will finish there, Jess, is that of course, from a rules and regulations perspective, they are all being updated at the moment. So the various different mineral resource reserve codes, of course, most of them are being updated right now, to give ESG a bit more of oomph within them, or certainly more guidance with regards to what do we actually mean. These updates have been a long time coming. South Africa went for it first, followed by Europe, but now the rest of the world is well on their way with regards to their updates. And of course, one of the main areas that's being updated within the modding, modifying factors is the ESG. So what do we actually mean by this? So go and check out the Crisco code and the guidance with regards to what is actually meant by saying, have we taken ESG into account? We need to prove that we've taken it into, a, into account if we want to, of course, move from that resource into that reserve base. And with that, of course, the additional financial value that typically comes with it. There are a huge number of different tools 
that we can use for all of this. And if anybody's interested, I'll send you a link to a conference where we went through many of the ones that are on this sheet of paper. But in closing, every successful mining operation needs three things. We need rock in the ground. We need financial demand for whatever it is we're digging out of the ground, but we need permission to be able to do it. And ESG comes in, primarily comes in in this third area. And this is an area that has changed massively over the last 10, 15 years or so. So is ESG a fad or is it fundamental? Well, ESG itself is just the current term for exploring and mining in a responsible manner. OK, so ESG equals responsibility equals sustainability. Some people will interpret it in a slightly different way, but basically that's what it means at the moment. Ultimately, if you're not doing it, investors will walk away and we won't be able to go and do the thing that we like best, which is, of course, licking rocks. So with that, I shall say thank you very much and open for questions. Thank you, Jess. Yeah. <sighs>